Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to lecture 8 of the course on multi-vedic data mining methods and applications. The title of this lecture is model assessment for multiple regression. Now, once you have fitted a multiple regression model, you are also interested in knowing how efficiently this model predicts a new observation. So, basically you are interested in predictive ability of the model and for that purpose you require certain measures of the predictive ability. In this lecture we will di discuss different uh, methods for measuring the predictive ability of the model. These methods are based on the V fold cross validation or bootstrapping procedures. So, we consider some model assessment procedures. So, of course, uh, good predictive ability is required or it is important for assessing the fit of a model to data. Because uh, when we fit a model, just minimizing the errors or error sum of square or testing the significance of the regression parameters or significance of the entire regression is not sufficient. In most of the cases, you are also interested in predicting a new observation. So, that is why the model should have good predictive ability also. Now, suppose you consider this learning set or learning data. You have observations x i y i i running from 1 to n. x i is r cross 1 vector of covariates or input variables and your test set is denoted by t. So, you have a new observation x nu y nu which belongs to the test set t. Then First, we regress y on x using observations in the learning set. So, we fit the model for the learning set and then on the basis of fitted model, we predict y nu using x nu and suppose the predicted value of y nu is y hat nu, then prediction error is y nu minus y hat nu. Then the mean squared error of prediction error gives you overall measure of quality of prediction. Now, we consider both the cases when x is random as well as when x is fixed. So, first we consider the case when x is random. So, for random x case, your learning set observations are IID observations from the joint probability distribution of x and y. And suppose y i i equal to 1 to n are generated by the regression model. Say so, y equal to beta naught plus x transpose beta plus u. So, this is the regression model using which y i has been generated and we write it equal to mu x plus u where nu x is actually the expected value of y given x. So, mu x equal to expectation of y given x which is equal to beta naught plus x transpose beta. Then expectation of u given x is assumed to be 0 and variance of u given x is assumed to be sigma square u. Now, we draw a new observation from p x y say x nu y nu. Then we assess the fitted model by predicting y nu from x nu. Now, in this regression function, if we replace 
beta naught by its estimator beta naught hat and beta by its estimator beta hat. Then we get the OLS regression function or an estimator of the regression function which is denoted by mu hat x. So, mu hat x is equal to beta naught hat plus x transpose beta hat and then y hat nu is equal to mu hat x nu. This is the predicted value of y corresponding to x nu. Then the prediction error is we denoted by P e r expected value of y nu minus mu hat x nu whole square. Actually mu hat x nu is equal to y hat nu. So, the prediction error is actually expectation of y nu minus y hat nu whole square or expectation of y nu minus mu hat x nu whole square. Now, in this expression we subtract mu x nu and then we add mu x nu and then we take a square of this. So, we take these two terms together and these two terms together. Now, if you take a square of this term and take expectation then actually y nu minus mu x nu is equal to the other term u or u may denote it by u nu which has variance sigma square u. So, if we take a square of this term and take expectation we get sigma square u and then we take a square of the second term expectation of mu x nu minus mu hat x nu and we write it equal to m e r. So, m e r is the expectation of mu x nu minus mu hat x nu whole square. Then we also get the cross product term, but if we take the expectation of cross product term, then the expectation of cross product term is equal to 0. So, the cross product term vanishes. Notice that expectation of y nu minus mu x nu is equal to 0 and uh, these two terms are uncorrelated with each other. So, that is why the expectation of cross product term vanishes. Further, mu x nu minus mu hat x nu is equal to mu x nu is equal to x beta and mu hat x nu is equal to x nu beta hat. So, their difference may be written as x nu beta minus beta hat and from here we observe that m e r is equal to beta minus beta hat transpose expectation of x nu x nu transpose and expectation of x nu x nu transpose is equal to sigma x x. So, we get sigma x x here and beta minus beta hat. Now, here you also notice that you are taking expectations over x nu y nu and since we are taking expectation over x nu y nu x is fixed and now we consider the second case when x is fixed. We generate the observations y i is on y from this model. So, y i equal to beta naught plus x i transpose beta plus u i and then we write beta naught plus x i transpose beta equal to mu x i plus you have u i here. So, mu x i is equal to beta naught plus x i transpose beta and this is the regression function evaluated at x i. Again as earlier we assume that u i is our i i d 
having mean 0 and value in sigma square u. Further, x i's are uncorrelated with u i. So, expectation of x i transpose u i is equal to 0. Then, we generate the test set by using x nu points. We have these input variable and using this input variable, we generate the output variable y nu. Now, there are two possibilities. X nu are either the same fixed design points x i as in the learning set. You take the same input variables, same values of the input variables uh, on the basis of which you have fitted the model, same x i s and then you again obtain the corresponding new y i s which has been generated by the model y i nu equal to beta naught plus x i transpose beta 1 plus u i or you can write u i nu here. And the second possibility is you have new design points x that are known and fixed and then we generate y i s on the basis of new design points. Now, first we take the case 1. So, that your test set is x i y i nu i equal to 1 to m. Using the same input data, we have generated y i s y i nu and we have repeated this experiment say m times. Then y i nu is equal to mu x i plus u i nu. Again u i nu's are independent of u i. Predicted value of y nu for fixed x is given by mu hat x equal to beta naught hat plus x transpose beta hat. This is the predicted value of y. Then the prediction error is say we denote it by p e f. This is equal to expectation of 1 upon m summation i equal to 1 to m y i nu minus mu hat x i whole square this quantity. Notice that we are repeating the experiment m times with the same set of input observations or input variables. We are generating new y i's m times. Then this is equal to sigma i square u plus m e f. Again, we have taken expectation over y i nu. In fact, again you write y i nu minus mu x i plus mu x i minus mu head x i here. Take a square of this. Again, if we take a square of these two terms, we get u i nu and u i nu square actually we get. And when we take expectation of 1 upon m summation i equal to 1 term u i nu square, then we get sigma square u. Again, we take a square of this term and then we take 1 upon m summation i equal to 1 to m mu x i minus mu hat x i whole square, which gives you m e f and the expectation of cross product term vanishes. So, m e f is equal to 1 upon m summation i equal to 1 to m mu x i minus mu hat x i whole square. Since we have taken expectation over y i nu and this term does not depend upon y i nu. So, this term behaves like a constant then this is equal to beta minus beta hat transpose 
1 upon m x transpose x beta minus beta head. Again, we make use of this result. MEF is the model error due to the lack of fit to the true model. So, this part gives you the model error due to lack of fit in the true model. Now, if d is large, d denotes the entire data set. Then we partition it into learning validation and test sets for estimating the regression function, predicting future outcomes and validating the model. So, in this case there is no problem. If d is large enough, then you can easily partition it into the three sets, learning set, validation set and the test set. But when d is small, then we face problem because uh, if d is small, you have a small number of observations in d, then if we partition, if we further partition d, then the learning set becomes very small and you will not get very efficient estimators. So, then we require some alternative methods. Now, we consider apparent error rate or resubstitution error rate. Apparent error rate actually measures how well the regression function predicts same members of D. So, you have data set say y i x i i equal to 1 to n and suppose for this data set you have fitted the model. So, this is your learning set then you predict y i's and then you develop a measure of how well the regression function predicts the same members of d means these y i's. So, this is your apparent error rate or the substitution error rate. Now, estimate of prediction error by apparent error rate for d is defined as say p hat mu hat d equal to 1 upon n summation i equal to 1 to n y i minus mu hat x i whole square. So, the actual value of y is y i and its predicted value is mu hat x i. So, prediction error is y i minus mu hat x i, we take a square of this, then we take summation from i equal to 1 to n and then we divide it by the sample size that is n or this is equal to the residual sum of square, this part gives you the residual sum of square and divide the residual sum of square by n. So, here mu hat x i is the predicted value of y i. So, actually this uh, apparent error rate or estimate of apparent error rate depends upon in sample prediction. Now, we consider some resampling methods. So, your resampling methods are based on either cross validation or bootstrap. So, again suppose d is the random sample from p x y then suppose n is equal to 2 m, we randomly divide d into two equal disjoint subsets say L and T. Since uh, two sets are equal, so there are m observations in L and m observations in T. And two sets are disjoint also. So, L intersection t is the null set phi. So, suppose uh, t is equal to x i t y i t i equal to 1 to m. Then we estimate p e r using the test set p e head mu head d equal to 1 upon m summation i equal to 1 to n y i t minus mu hat x i t whole square. So, basically what you have done, 
you have randomly divided the data set or the random sample into two equal parts and if n is equal to 2 m, then we take m observations in the learning set and m observations in the test set. On the basis of observations in the learning set, we fit the model and then we test the model for the test set. So, we find the predicted values of y i t on the basis of fitted model for the learning set. So, this is the actual value of y i t, this is the predicted value. We take the difference, take square of this and then we take summation from i equal to 1 to m and then we divide it by m. Again, we switch the learning set and test set. So, now we fit the model for the old test set, which is our new learning set and your old learning set is now your new test set. And then we average the resulting two estimates of P E R to get a final estimate. So, this is the procedure. Now, we consider V fold cross validation. Now, suppose uh, n is equal to v into m and v is greater than or equal to 2. Here, we split d randomly into v disjoint subsets. Say t v v equal to 1 to capital V and each of these subsets is of size m. Further, d is equal to union v equal to 1 to capital V T v and T v intersection T v dash is null set. So, all these v subsets are disjoint. Then we create capital V different versions of the data set and each version has a subset as test set say T w which has m observations and learning set say L w which is the union of all T v except T w. So, L w has v minus 1 into m observations. So, basically what you have done, you have divided d into v disjoint subsets and suppose uh, in the first iteration you write T 1 equal to T and then you take union of T 2 T V this equal to L 1. So, T 1 is your test set. and L 1 is your learning set. Ultimately, T 1 has m observations and the learning set has v minus 1 into m observations. Then suppose mu hat minus w x is the OLS regression function using L w. We fit the model for the observations in L w and we evaluate this regression at T w test cases and this gives you mu hat minus w x i. So, this is actually the predicted value of observation on output variable corresponding to x i, x i belongs to T w. Then we compute the prediction error from T w and repeat the procedure v times and e each time we are cycling through T 1, T 2, T v. So, first time you have taken T 1 as say test set and the union of the remaining v minus 1 sets as your learning set. Second time you may take T 2 as your test set and uh, 
the union of the meaning v minus 1 set says learning set and so on. Then we combine all these results and this gives you v fold cross validation estimate of prediction as a PE. So, PE head C v given v is equal to 1 upon capital V summation w equal to 1 to capital V summation x i y i belonging to T w y i minus mu head minus w x i whole square. So, this is the estimate of P e based on v fold cross validation. Then suppose sigma head square u is the residual variance obtained from the full data set. Then we subtract sigma head square u from p head e to get an estimate of m e, m e head. Another rule is leave one out rule. We denoted by L O O as C V given N. Here M is equal to 1 and V is equal to N. So, each time what we do we have N observations. We take one observation in your test set N minus 1 observations in your learning set. And then we repeat this process. So, we repeat this process n times. So, capital V is equal to n. So, learning set has size n minus 1 and test set has size 1. Again, we fit the model for these n minus 1 observations and predict the value of y for this observation in the test set. Then at the ith stage x i y i is omitted from the ith learning set and OLS regression function new head minus i x is computed from the learning set. So, we compute this new head minus i x by fitting the model to n minus 1 observations we leave the ith observation from the n observations and then we get n minus 1 observations. And then we estimate P e as P e had C v given n equal to 1 upon n summation i equal to 1 to n y i minus mu head minus i x i whole square. Now, leave one out rule estimate of P e r has low bias, but high variance. The reason is that there is a high degree of similarity between the leave one out learning sets. If you take any two learning sets, then there is a difference of just two observations. So, suppose in first learning set you have left out first observation in the second learning set you have included the first observation, but you left the second observation. So, there is a very small difference. Then 5 fold or 10 fold estimate of P e r has higher bias, but lower mean squared error also lower variance. It has lower mean squared error because of this lower variance, though it has a bit higher bias. Again, 5 fold or 10 fold cross validation is better at model assessment than leave one out cross validation. But of course, leave one out cross validation looks more simple. Now, we come to the bootstrap procedure. So, first we consider unconditional bootstrap which is used for the random x case. So, we draw a random sample with the placement of size n from D. D is your entire data set. Size of sample here is n and from these n observations we draw a sample of the same size that is n, but with the placement. So, obviously, some of the observations are repeated and some of the observations are left out. 
and then we get a random x bootstrap sample as a d star r b equal to x i star b y i star b i equal to 1 to n. So, although the size of the sample is the same, but this d star r b is different from d in general because of width replacement. Then we regress y i star b on x i star b i equal to 1 to n. We fit the model for this data set and uh, after fitting the model we get this OLS regression function. Then we apply this OLS regression function you had r star b x to the original sample d to get the estimate of p e. So, basically you have fitted the model for this data set and then you have applied this regression function to the original sample to get the estimate of p e and the estimate of p e is p e head mu head star r d b d is equal to 1 upon n summation i equal to 1 to n y i minus mu head r star b x i whole square. So, this is an estimate of p e and since you have taken say b bootstrap samples. So, again we average this estimate over these b bootstrap samples to get a sample bootstrap estimate of p e as p e head r d equal to 1 upon capital B summation b equal to 1 to capital B p e head mu head r star b d. So, this is the estimate of p e, but this estimate is not a good estimate of p e and the reason is different bootstrap samples and d have common observations. So, in this sense p e head r d will be over optimistic. There are a lot of common observations which you are using for estimating the model as well as for prediction purpose also. Now, we consider an alternative estimator. Here we apply mu head r star b to d r star b to obtain apparent as a rate for d r star b. So, instead of applying mu head r star b to the entire sample, we just apply it to d r star b and then we obtain the apparent error rate. So, this is the estimate of apparent error rate for d r star b and then we average this apparent error rate over all bootstrap samples. So, we have capital B bootstrap samples. So, we average this estimate over B bootstrap samples uh, which gives you P e head R d R star equal to 1 upon capital B summation B equal to 1 to capital B P hat e mu hat R star B d R star B. So, we get this estimate. Again this estimator also has the same disadvantages as the apparent error rate for d because ultimately this estimate relies upon the apparent error rate. So, this also has the same disadvantages. Now, we consider optimism corrected bootstrap estimator of P e. Then uh, we have observed that RSS upon n is your apparent error rate for d and this is an estimator of P e. Then an estimate of bias of RSS upon n for d r star b is the b th optimism that is it is based upon the b th bootstrap sample. So, optimism had r b 
is equal to P e head mu head R star B D minus P e head mu head R star B D R star B. So, this is based upon the entire sample or entire data set and this is based upon the bth bootstrap sample and the difference between two is the bth optimism. Then overall estimate of optimism is say we average this bth optimism over all bootstrap samples and then this gives you P e head d minus P e head d r star. Then optimism head r is an estimator of average optimism that is expectation of P e mu head d minus P e head mu head d. So, we get an estimator of average optimism from here or from here. Then the bootstrap estimator of P e is we estimate RSS upon n for this bias. So, we add this term in RSS upon n to get a bootstrap estimator of P e. Further using the relationship between P e, M e and sigma square u, we can estimate M e by M e hat r equal to P e hat r minus sigma hat square u. Then this estimator which has been adjusted for bias has lower bias. Then for model assessment, it is better than the tenfold cross validation. Now, for the uh, suppose P i b is the probability that i th observation is selected at least once in the b th bootstrap sample. P i b is equal to 1 minus 1 minus 1 upon n to the power n because 1 upon n is the probability that it has been selected in a particular trial. Then 1 minus 1 upon n is the probability that it has not been selected in a particular trial and then there are n trials. So, 1 minus 1 upon n to the power n is the probability that a particular observation is not selected and then 1 minus 1 minus 1 upon n to the power n is the probability that it has been selected at least once. And if we take n tending to infinity then this probability tends to 1 minus 1 upon e which is approximately equal to 0.632. So, the bootstrap contains about 0.632 n distinct observations and it may lead to n approximately equal to r and x transpose x may be singular or nearly singular. r is the number of variables. It may also lead to n less than r. That case x transpose x is singular or even if n is greater than or equal to r, x transpose x may be nearly singular for the bootstrap sample. So, mu head r star b becomes difficult to obtain particularly when x transpose x is singular. Then for improving optimism estimate and P e had r for i equal to 1 to n. We compute the prediction errors for x i y i only from boot bootstrap samples not containing i th observation. 
So, for obtaining the prediction error, we only consider those samples which do not contain the ith observation. So, suppose P e r 1 is the expected bootstrap prediction error for x i y i belonging to D not included in the bth bootstrap sample and n i b equal to number of times i th observation x i y i appears in the bth bootstrap sample. And then we define indicators function i capital I i b equal to 1 if n i b equal to 0 and 0 otherwise if n i b is greater than or equal to 1. Then estimator of p e r 1 p e say p e r had 1 is equal to 1 upon n summation i equal to 1 n p e i head or p e i head is equal to summation over b we take this indicator function capital I i b y i minus mu hat b x i whole square divided by summation over b capital I i b, which is equal to the sum of this denominator is b i, the number of bootstrap samples in which the ith observation is included. Then we take summation b belonging to c i y i minus mu hat b x i whole square. Uh, here p e r hat 1 is leave 1 out bootstrap estimator and c i is the set of indices of the bootstrap samples that do not contain the ith observation x i y i and such observations are called out of bootstrap observations. And uh, B i is actually equal to the number of such bootstrap samples. Now, P e had C v given n 1 is nearly unbiased, whereas P e had R 1 is more biased upwards than P e had C v given n 1. Then 0 0.632 bootstrap estimator of optimism is given by this quantity. Say optimism r had 0.632 is equal to 0 0.632, we multiply by this number p e hat r 1 minus p e hat mu hat d. Further 0 0.632 bootstrap estimator of prediction error is again we take p e head r 0.632 equal to p e head mu head d and then we add this optimism here, this quantity which is equal to the 0.368 into RSS upon n plus 0.632 p e head r 1. So, ultimately we get this expression. Then this 0 0.632 bootstrap estimator provides an improvement over the apparent error rate, but still it underestimates P e r. So, in this lecture we have discussed different estimators of predictive ability. We have used different uh, resampling procedures like one fold cross validation or v fold cross validation as well as bootstrapping for the obtaining an estimator or improved estimator of predictive ability or prediction error. Now, sometimes uh, you face the problem of multi collinearity in fitting a regression model, uh, which is actually uh, comes from the high correlation between different input variables. So, in the next lecture we will consider the multicollinearity problem, uh, what are its consequences, how is it going to affect your model or the, the 
efficiency of different estimators and then we will also discuss how to select variables for fitting a multiple regression model. So, here I am going to stop. Thank you. Hi, I am Chitwan Lalji, a PhD student of Health Economics under the supervision of Dr. Debian Pakrashi uh, from the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, IIT Kanpur. In one of my essays, I am interested in understanding the relationship between consumption of fruits and vegetables and various health indicators. Health indicators, both subjective and objective health indicators like mental health, self-assessed health, various measures of blood pressure and various measures of cholesterol. Uh, measures of blood pressure like systolic and diastolic BP, you have your incidence of high BP MAP and incidence of high MAP. And as far as cholesterol is concerned, I have tried to concentrate more on total cholesterol, good cholesterol and incidence of high cholesterol. Now before I go on to what have been my major contributions and various policy implications, I would like to briefly tell you about the policy initiatives of WHO and various countries. The WHO that is the World Health Organization, it started with a campaign of 5 a day. That is you should have 5 portions of fruits and vegetables per day. That would be approximately you could say 400 grams of fruits and vegetables. Now a portion, before we go further, I will just tell you what exactly is a portion. One portion is equivalent to a medium sized apple or one small glass of fruit juice which is approximately 150 milliliters and uh, maybe 3 teaspoons of vegetables. So, uh, the WHO went with a 5 a day campaign which was further taken up by various countries. Countries like UK, Netherlands, Germany, Norway, they adopted the 5 a day policy while some went for expansionary dietary policies like France, Australia, Canada, Denmark. So, for example, Australia it went for go for 2 plus 5 policy in which it said that you should consume five por 2 portions of fruits and 5 portions of vegetables per day. And USA went for a policy of fruits and vegetables more matters. That is you must consume more and more fruits and vegetables. Now, irrespective of these expansionary dietary policies and dietary propagations, it has been found that only 28 percent of women and 25 percent of men they actually meet the recommended dietary norms of five a, po five a day portion. So, the major contribution of my work is firstly to find an association between fruits and vegetables, whether there exists a relationship between fruits and vegetables and health indicators and if they exist, whether if due to heterogeneity in the data, so I will be doing it according to age, by gender and by uh, your weight. So, apart from that, I will go for policy recommendations in which I will, I am basically studying uh, how much fruits and vegetables matter, apart from that, which type matters more. So, for that, I have taken data from the Health Survey of England. Health Survey of England is an annual survey which takes uh, data, which con conducts information regularly on demographic and socioeconomic characteristics. You have your lifestyle behaviors like an individual smokes or does not smoke, alcohol consumption, you have your sedentary and physical activities and you have various health uh, indicators also which have been collected. Uh, so, uh, before I go on to what exactly is my research, I would like to concentrate more on fruits and vegetables like what kind of questions were asked in the survey. Questions like what kind of fresh fruit do you eat? Did you eat any dried fruit yesterday? Do not count dried fruits in cereals, cakes. Apart from that, for vegetables, they asked how many tablespoons of vegetables did you eat yesterday? So, approximately after this whole survey was conducted, data was converted into portions of fruits and uh, like for example, three, por three tablespoons of vegetables is equivalent to one portion. So, data was converted and provided to the users that is us. 
from the UK Data Health Survey. So the major con contributions of my paper is that I found a strong negative association between uh, intake of fruits and self-assessed health, then various measures of uh, blood pressure like mean arterial pressure, high mean arterial pressure, high blood pressure, systolic and diastolic BP and your total cholesterol. Apart from that, I have found a strong positive association between consumption of vegetables and good cholesterol. So it is recommended in a way that if you want to control your blood pressure, you must consume more and more fruits. And as far as vegetables are concerned, they impact your good cholesterol. Apart from that, I went in for a falsification test. A falsification test is basically conducted to know whether the model that you have adopted and the conclusions that you are drawing are not spurious. So if uh, a falsification test is done to know, in a way it is tested by seeing an indicator, a health indicator which is not being impacted by your consumption of fruits and vegetables. And then see, we see whether there is significant result or not. If there is no significant result, that means your model is good and your results are non-spurious. So what we did is for falsification test, we took ear complaints and infectious diseases. Now ear complaints like if you are deaf since birth or you have some kind of imbalance body imbalance that is not being impacted by your post consumption of fruits and vegetables and we did find insignificant results apart from that infectious diseases like hiv a hiv aids etc we found similar insignificant results indicating that our uh, that our results are not spurious non spurious apart from that we went uh, since there was a, a lot of heterogeneity in the data like uh, by gender, by age and by weight. We, can, we did the regression analysis. We found results which stated that as far as uh, fruits are concerned, it impacts a male's health more than a female's health. So it is basically said a, a man should consume more fruits to impact his health, whereas as far as vegetables are concerned, they impact a women's health more. But this has been only seen as far as cholesterol is concerned, the various measures of cholesterol like total cholesterol, good cholesterol and your incidence of getting high cholesterol. Now after this we went in for a policy implication and in the policy implication we found, we tried to find two policy implications, what matters and exactly how much portion matters. So as far as how much portion matters, we have found that on an average, five or more portions of fruits impact your overall health, that is your self-assessed health, your MAP, your incidence of high MAP and incidence of high BP. But if you want to have a good mental health, so you can optimize your mental health by consuming three or four portions of fruits as well. And similarly, has, uh, as far as self-assessed health and total cholesterol is concerned, an individual must consume four to five portions to optimally have the impact of consumption of fruits. Apart from that, vegetables have had a very little impact on your health. It only impacts your incidence of getting high MAP and high BP and uh, you, it's seen that only it impacts when you consume five or more portions of fruits. So an optimum consumption of five or more portions of fruits and vegetables are recommended. But fruits have a more impact on your overall health, on various measures like self-assessed health, mental health, your various measures of blood pressure and various cholesterol levels. Another thing that we find is which type of fruit matters. It has been seen that all size fruits, they impact your self-assessed health, your systolic and diastolic blood pressure, your mean arterial pressure, your high BP and incidence of getting high MAP and high cholesterol. But we find that uh, as far as frozen fruits or canned fruits are concerned, they have a, they help in regulating your incidence of getting high MAP or high BP, but it has a trade-off that means there is something negative happening, it reduces the good cholesterol in your body. Apart from this, it, if, you ha if you have an incidence of getting high cholesterol, it is recommended that you must consume fruit juices because it has a s impact in reducing your probability of getting high cholesterol. And uh, dried fruits, they impact your self-assessed health. As far as vegetables are concerned, very little impact has been seen. It has only been seen in case of uh, uh, portion of salads and its association with self-assessed health. Another thing that they have seen is vegetables in composite, they have an association with good cholesterol. So overall, my research basically says that there is an association between 
consumption of fruits and vegetables and various health indicators and um, it is highly recommended that an individual in order to be healthy must consume five or more portions of fruits and five or more portions of vegetables per day but fruits have a more impact on your overall health apart from that all size fruits they have a better impact on your overall health your mental health various measures of blood pressure and cholesterol so thank you understanding oneself understanding others understanding society at large understanding the nature these are all driven by basic human curiosity we would all love to understand why things happen what happens what is the final outcome why certain things fail these are all exercises that we perform in various domains of knowledge therefore knowledge in various domains you would realize they are actually social artifacts they have to be rooted into historical perspective they have to be culturally salient and there would be socio political reasons behind this whether you talk with respect to engineering sciences whether you talk with respect to physical sciences biological sciences social sciences that's the reason why humanities and social sciences should be understood by all of us the knowledge that is segregated that is divided with respect to areas specializations all of them needs to be understood in its context and what provides the context it is the social reality how do you correlate knowledge in a given domain with the cultural reality with the social reality with the socio political compulsions okay how do you understand the law of nature okay in its totality and for doing that you require the understanding of humanities and social sciences say for instance if you are trying to understand the effect of a particular bacteria a virus any microbe how it affects behavior how it affects the organism human being you start looking at it from a pure biological point of view if you are trying to look at a particular type of a wavelength say for example you are emphasizing on the understanding of the effect of radiation on human life you are looking at things from a physical point of view you are looking at the corresponding changes inside the body you are looking at the physiological side of the uh, understanding of the information you are trying to understand why despite knowing the risk that is inbuilt in the process why still human beings engage into it you are looking at it from a pure behavioral point of view why society at large admire things which has full of risk you are trying to understand things from a pure sociological point of view why people use particular uh, set of words to explain those experiences you are trying to understand things from the linguistic point of view so there are whole lot of things and then finally you try to combine all of them to say that what are the guiding principles in life then you say you are looking at life you are looking at humanity from a pure philosophical point of view and this is what social sciences courses provide you they provide the context to you in which you would be finally positioning the understanding of the knowledge in any given domain it could be engineering it could be sciences it could be medical sciences it could be social sciences stuff it could be humanities stuff so con contextualizing the knowledge is what humanities social science courses help you obtain